I got to tell you, first time I saw that video, I, I usually get worried about videos like that. Um, it made me cry, so I watched it about five times just to center myself. And if, if I do anything today, I just want to be the bridge between that video and the song that Dre and Lee have chosen um, to send us out. I think, I think those are the power. I'll try to be the extension cord, okay, from God to me to them to us. If you're worshiping online, we're so glad you're with us today. I'm Chip Freed, the lead teaching pastor here at Garfield Memorial Church. We're glad to be in person, glad for you to join us online. Maybe you're joining us during the week on a playback. Uh, we feel connected beyond even days and, and time, and so glad uh, you're with us. Um, today, uh, you know, I, I do hope you find connections with uh, Friendsgiving. My wife elbowed me when she found out I signed up for three of them. Um, yesterday. Uh, we need to make connections. We need to be with people. We need to be together. That's what that scripture talked about. I also want to remind us uh, on November 17th, our new bishop, Bishop Hesu Young, who's a powerful man of prayer. He'll be here with us. Uh, he's not preaching, but he wants to, he'll greet us and, and we'll have time to meet after. And it is Baptism Sunday. I think we already have five folks that have come forward for baptism, a family, and and if you've been thinking about, yeah, you can cheer for that. Don't, don't worry. Always interrupt me with applause, okay? Um, don't heckle me, but uh, no, I'm kidding. But uh, if you've been thinking about baptism or if you want to reaffirm your baptism, um, just let us know. Uh, as Pastor Kurt likes to say, there's a QR code if you were here last week. Um, I, I was joking with Flora Mart. We were sitting there when Kurt kept talking about them. Uh, and he said, I'm a QR code. I said, on the staff Christmas card, we're just going to put a QR code over his face. So, Kurt, I'm sorry. That I, I gave up the goods. But there's opportunity for baptism. Our, our bishop's also leading a day of prayer. Uh, there's one bus departing from Garfield going down to Worthington on the Saturday before Thanksgiving. Or you can, um, you can there's a live stream of that. So I can't wait till you meet him. And I, I can't wait for him to celebrate baptism with us together. Okay, you ready? Here's my uh, sermon title today. It is Romans, Republicans, and Democrats. From the book of Romans. See what I did there? I want to tell you something. I'm not preaching about the election. I'm preaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Karl Barth, um, who was probably the greatest modern-day theologian, he said to preachers, he said, preachers always have to have the Bible in one hand and have their tablets in the other hand. Actually, he's old, so he said to have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other hand, but a thir you know, only a third of our folk who worship here know what a newspaper is, so I, I, just, I just brought up a little more contemporary, okay? The Bible in one hand, we need to know the good news, and then we need to know the news, of which we take the good news too, right? This is called in preaching what we're trained to do as we go through the study of it, is a combination of description and prescription. You go to the scriptures for description, what's wrong with the world, what's broken in us, and you find it all in there, and you find instructions for how to fix it. That's description as I break down the scriptures. But then prescription, how do we apply it to the world and to our lives? Jesus Christ gives us the solution. But the world, we know, has a problem. And the problem in our world and in our country and often in too many churches is the problem that we are divided. It's a problem of division, right? Now, let me just let you know, if you read your scriptures, there is an author of division. <laughs> there is a force in the world that seeks to divide. Now, if you go to West Point or the Naval Academy, a, a, a Pythagorean 101 of the military of warfare is what? Divide and conquer. You, you don't think Satan knew about that like 3,000 years ago? That he seeks to divide. Look what he did with Judas. Uh, look what he does with me. Look what he does with you. That's why Paul will say, fight back through forgiveness. Because when you forgive, you make no room for division. You make no room for that to come into you, right? If Satan were a math professor, you know what he'd focus on? Division and subtraction. 
But Jesus Christ, the great math teacher, focuses on addition and multiplication, adding, seeking the lost sheep to add into the family of God, seeking you and I to reconcile and add each other to each other's lives when we fall apart, and multiplying loaves and fish to feed people who can't afford food for themselves. This is, this is the work and the counter work in, in the division we have. And, and see, when we, when we stray from God, and, and frankly, when we stray from one another, we descend into division. Division is one of the pits that the Psalms talk about. You I have gone down into the pit, descending into division, and that division has costs, real costs. I realized about this. I was reading in my tablet uh, toward the end of the summer, the beginning of the fall, that on August 28th, um, in San Isabel National Forest, 15 executives that worked at the same company went on a hike. They went on the hike as a team building activity, and they were given chores to do together, and they were broken into small groups, and some would go to the summit, and some would go to other tasks, and, and then they would descend back down the marked trail to find their way back home. And in the midst of this, this team building activity, one person got separated from the group and nobody noticed. And while they were doing their tasks, he was ascending to the summit. And as he finally got to the summit, all the 14 others were descending. And as they descended, they were pulling up all the markers from the trail on how to get back home. And as this person then could not find his group and could not find his way, do you know they found him, rescue workers, 36 hours later, shivering by a drainage ditch. Friends, that's what happens when we descend into division. We pull up markers, and for our children and others who are seeking to ascend, they can't find their way home. And it's because of us. And, and, and this is why we need to look at what is the work in this week, and, and many of us already voted, we, I have, but, but this isn't about how to vote, though I'd like to tell you. This is, about, um, this is about how to behave and how to bring people back together and how to model it in ourselves. So I turn to Romans. Why? Because Paul is the greatest preacher about reconciliation and repairing relationships in the entire Gospels. Now, we have to take him seriously because Paul was not always Paul. Paul used to be Saul. Saul was the greatest divider of the first century. As Saul, he divided people. He knew he was right. He knew the Bible better than anybody else. And if you didn't agree with him, you were, you were nobody. You, were, you, you might be discarded. It was his way or the highway. He was an absolute racist and bigot. He hated people of not, that weren't of his ethnicity. He hated Gentiles. He hated uh, Samaritan. He felt they should be expelled from the earth. He was an absolute misogynist. He thought women were third class. They had, should have no voice in the courts or, or any voice into the synagogue or, or the temple. In fact, Saul, as a Pharisee, true story, I can show you this historically, Every day he got up in the morning, his first prayer would be, God, I thank you that you did not make me a woman. And Saul was violent. If you read uh, uh, Acts 9, it said he went into Damascus, again, looking for his enemies, breathing violence. He preached violence against anyone who didn't agree with him. And in fact, that violence led to murder. And Saul killed early Christians because he felt they were, you know, not of his ilk. In fact, if you read Acts 6, the first Christian martyr named Stephen, Saul stirred up the crowd and said, I'll hold anybody's coats who will go and stone this man to death. That's who Saul was. But he met Jesus. He met the risen, he met Jesus the way we meet Jesus. He didn't walk with Jesus as the inner circle. He, he, he didn't, you know, watch him walk on the water or feed the crow. He met Jesus the way we meet Jesus, as the risen Jesus. And Jesus went to Saul and said, look, you are persecuting me. He said, I don't even know who you are. He said, when you speak bad, when you use rhetoric, when you use violence against any of my children, you are doing it to me. 
and something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he began to deconstruct and then reconstruct. In fact, you don't know this, but Saul went away for 13 years and studied under the feet of others and, and studied his scriptures and said, what's all this been pointing to? Is Jesus. And he came back out as a new person. In fact, Jesus gave him a wonderful task. He said, you know all those people you hated before? You know all those prejudices and biases you had? You know how much you think Gentiles are worthless and not worth? I'm gonna send you to them to be their apostle. And Paul came out from once being the great divider to being one of the greatest reconcilers in the history of the world. He, he helped plant God's church. You know, God's church had a purpose the cross was to deal with our division from God and to bring us back into right relationship with God. The church, his mission originally was to deal us with our division from one another and reconcile us one to another and to God. And so in the midst of this division that we need to bring the good news to, I turn to Paul's writing in Romans. Romans is his masterpiece. Romans, one scholar said, is the most uh, complicated, in-depth, theological, and influential letter of the New Testament. Paul wrote letters to churches who had problems. There was only one letter written to a church that didn't have a problem. It was a Philippian church, and he celebrated them. And oh, by the way, it was the most diverse church in the entire world at the time. But he, every other church had a problem. And the Roman church had it the worst, but all of them had it. You know what their problem was? Division. Christians were dividing from one another. Can you imagine? I've never heard of such a thing. Right? And Paul writes it. And in, in, in Rome had it the worst. I mean, Corinthians had it. If you read at the beginning, he addresses them, and he said, I've been hearing about the quarrels you've had. And what does he write? 1 Corinthians 13, in that letter, he talks about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not demand its own way. Love, love doesn't hold grudges. Love seeks and resists injustice to build forward the truth. And you know, where do we hear that read all the time? At weddings. Had nothing to do with it, but go ahead and read it. Terry and I did. What was it dealing with? Division. In the church. And in Rome, they were divided. There were two groups. You've never heard this before, but there was a conservative group and there was a liberal group. Never heard these. These are all new. See what happens when you go into your Bible? It, it, the conservative group <coughs> was the Jewish Christians. They had come to Christ, but they had come so through the history of Jews, Judaism. They were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And, and then they came to accept Christ as Lord and, and Messiah. But, but they were conservative to their old ways, and they felt, you need to do these things to be saved. Now, the Gentile Christians who Paul brought in, they were new to faith. They were newbies. They didn't practice the Mosaic law. They came in, into faith, and they were more progressive, and they, they felt like, you know, we're not encumbered by those things. And what resulted was a major conflict. <clears throat> Let me just tell you some of the conflicts they had. See, when we, when we descended to division... The things we fight about sometimes can be pretty silly, like Black Lives Matter or All Lives Matter, masks. I mean, what I'm going to tell you here, you're probably going to snicker at, and I pray to God that future generations will snicker at us over the things that resulted from us descending into division. The first, the first problem they had was what I call to meet or not to meet. Right? Some ate meat, some ate vegetables. What was this? Was this a crisis between keto and being vegan? Was this PETA standing up for the animals? No. One scholar said, through the Greco-Roman world and Judaism, they would kill and eat a cow as easily as they would pick an olive from a tree. But what's going on here? What's going on is that there was a sacrifice of animals in Jerusalem. They would sacrifice animals, and they, the whole animal would be offered to God and burned up. But this is in Rome. It's in the center of the empire, and Christianity is just emerging. And so what's most prevalent in Rome are the pagan temples to the pagan gods. And what they did is they would sacrifice animals too, but they would take it in, and they would cut out the best meat, the choice cuts. They would offer it to the pagan god, and then the rest of the meat would be taken to market to sell. And the Jewish Christians said, we can't eat that meat. That meat was offered to a pagan god. 
That would be horrible. That's like, that's like idolatry. But the Gentile Christians came in and says, there's no pagan gods. They're just silly stories. They're nothing. We're not bound by that, and we're just going to the store to buy meat. And they divided over that. And the Jewish Christians felt superior because we have the law. We were the original article. And the Gentile Christians felt superior because they're like, boy, are you folks so holding on to things that really don't matter. And, and, and that's what was going on. And so the other thing they argued about was the high holy days. One person considers some days to be more sacred than others, while another person considers all days to be the same. Each person should have their own convictions. And if you read on that chapter, it says, have your own convictions and do all things that honor God. He's saying, this is, you know, it's not that big a deal. What's this about? Well, the Jew Judaism, the Jewish Christians, they had all the festivals, right? They're very different festivals for different seasons and new moons. You read it in the New Testament. Jesus went through those. There was a festival of lights. There was a festival of the booths. I always have to say booths like the TH because some people, I had at 9 o'clock before said, did you say the festival of booths? No, booths. It's like my cousin Vinny. Did you say youth? No, youth. Right, it, you know, and it's it, it, but they practice these, and and they continue to practice these, and they there was remembrance of older times. It was in their tradition, and and they celebrated it, and they they were great times of feast and celebration. And they were mad that these Gentile Christians didn't practice them. And they said, well, "It's okay that you practice them. We we just don't." You know, we just, we just had Halloween, and, and, and you hear at Halloween, there's always this Christian controversy. What is it? Well, some Christians, you know, think Halloween is satanic, and it's opening a door to the cult, and I don't want any involvement or practice of it. And other Christians say, well, I, you know, I don't think I'm practicing satan Satan if my kid dresses up like Bluey and goes out with his friends and the people sit in the neighborhood and sit on the stoops. And, and you know what Paul would say? Which one's right and which one's wrong? He'd say, yes. It's freaking Halloween. It's triggered. I mean, if you feel that's something that opens the door to the devil, you shouldn't do it. And, and if you feel it's just a time to fellowship with neighbors, that's okay. And see, this is the stuff that was making them divide. If you go down to verse 21, they were dividing over wine the way they divide over meat. Some would drink wine because wine was offered in the pagan temples. And, and it, it, it seems kind of silly, doesn't it? And you know what happens? When we focus on ourselves, the more we divide. The more we descend. We move away from each other. When we're hung up on these things, we move away from each other. It's an old corny story, but I remember there was a story of a man. He was, um, he was stranded on a desert island, right? He was like Tom Hanks in that FedEx commercial that went for like three hours a few years ago. You've seen a commercial, Castaway. Um, you know, and, and he was like that. And, and they rescued this man. They rescued him, and they, he'd been there for years and years, and he had built this little village. And, and at both sides of the village, one on the left and one on the right, there were these big structures. And he said, he said, what are those two things? He said, those are churches. He said, well, why do you have two? You're here alone. He said, well, that's the church I go to, and that's the one I used to go to. See, we... We, even within ourselves, we get divided. Paul said, the good I want to do, I don't do, and we're conflicted. And when we do that, we move away. I've been reading a book that I read. It came out in 2020. It's by Robert Putnam. Robert Putnam is a, a Harvard research professor. He wrote Bowling Together. It was a Pulitzer Prize years ago. He studied community, community why community comes together, why it breaks apart. And in this one in 2020, he wrote The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. People saying, why is America so divided? Robert Putnam said, we've been here before. See, we think this is the first time. We were divided like this in 1880s after the Civil War. And Robert Putnam studied this, and he has what he calls the I-We-I -I curve. What's happened from the 80s, and he said, you know, that we were focused on rugged individualism, right? Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, social Dar Darwinism, survival of the fittest, get it your way by any means necessary, right? That was the 1880s. And what Robert Putnam did was he studied political speeches, he studied writings, he studied media at the time, and he realized that the most common usage of, of talking about people was I, me, and my. That was part of the community. But what happened 
as the, we start getting into the 60s and then the, the 70s, he said, studying that ascent, what happened is all that same literature was no longer I, me, and my, but it was we, us, and ours. And as people talked that way and actually even joined together at the apex to destroy apartheid in our country, the greatest residue from slavery that led to division, he, we were at a high, but he said in the 80s, the language of all those things went back to I, me, and my, and it's brought us back now down to where we were. And, and, and there, look what it happens. We move away from each other when we focus on just me. Here's uh, Pew Research did this. This was in 1994. They did a study from there to 2017. And here, blue is Democrat, red is Republican, right? And, you know, these are the extremes, right and left. And all this area in the middle is what we hold in common. And look at that graph. We're way more, there's way more that unites us than there is that divides us. And look where the median place was for a Democrat and a Republican. Not that far apart, right? But look what happened by the time we got to 2017. I, me, my, is what? It pulled us way out. And now there's way more extremism, and look how small the area has gotten where, where the place that we are to call to be together. So what does Paul do? In chapter 14 that Dave read, Paul is given his prescription. And his prescription for divisiveness, it takes him 13 chapters to get there. I'll tell you why in a minute. But his prescription is this. Let's, let's, is that, is that individual language or corporate language? It's let us, right? It doesn't say let me. Let us strive for the things that bring peace and the things that build each other up. Now, why it takes Paul 13 chapters to finally get to the prescription is because he's doing the description. He's centering himself in the gospel. He does, Romans is the most illustrative book in the entire Bible describing for us what the gospel of Jesus Christ really is. And that's why he says at his opening, <clears throat> he says, I am not ashamed of this gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who has faith. Anybody ever been to a revival? I used to preach them. I had the sprayed hair and the white shoes, you know. And I did. Um, I was young. Um, and we were going to revival, and that was the most commonly used, you know, verse for the revivals. And guess what? It was inaccurate because it was, it was half of the verse. Paul didn't say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for the power of God and the salvation for everyone has faith. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel for the power of God unto salvation for everyone who has faith to the Jew and also to the Gentile. See, it was Paul's premise on how we fix division and we fix it by keeping Jesus first. We keep it by centering ourselves in God and in Jesus Christ, the great uniter. You know, this kind of crazy crowd that Jesus brought together. There were rich and there were poor and there was men and there were women and he empowered women in scandalous ways and there were people of all different ethnicities and there were, there were, there were people you know, who were slaves and people who were free, people who were educated and uneducated. What an interesting sort Jesus brings together. And the problem is we can't stay together because it begins to be about me and not about God. I love how Paul signs this letter. I think they, they did really smart in the back in that day and age. You didn't sign the letter at the end like we do. You signed it at the beginning, which is pretty smart because when I get a letter before I read it, I go to the back of it to figure out who sent it to me. And if it's sent to me my Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous, I don't read it, right? But Paul identifies himself. He says, Paul, I do this. If you read my letters or my emails, it says Chip Freed, you know, lead pastor, garfieldchurch.org. Sometimes I, I even go to my full title, Chip Freed, chief missional strategist and lead teaching pastor of garfieldmemorialchurch.org, the most diverse church in the state of Ohio. You know, I do that. Paul doesn't do any of that. Paul would have every right to sign his letter, Paul, the founder and the planter and the, you know, charter leader of the Church of Rome. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do what I do with my egotism. He says, Paul, here's my title, 
a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. He's saying Jesus first. You know, I know there's this thing out there about America first. It's a political slogan. It's fine. But as I have to tell you as a preacher of the gospel, it is horrible theology. God never says that. In fact, he says to Israel when they think Israel first, read Amos 9, 6. He said, oh, Israel first? He said, aren't you just like the Egyptians to me? Aren't you just like the Babylonians to me? Can I do with you what I did with them? Don't, don't get haughty in your exceptionalism and nationalism, right? We have to understand it's not America first. It's Jesus first. It's his kingdom first. It's not Republican first. It's Jesus first. It's kingdom first. It's not Democrat first. Notice I said Republican. I looked to the left side of the room and, and you know, Democrat to the right. I am so ornery. I, my wife says I have the spiritual gift of irritation. She's so right. Um, it's not Republican first. It's not Democrat first. It's Jesus first. The kingdom first. In fact, I've been saying to people, people have been saying that if you're a Christian, you won't vote for fill in the blank. I said, that's garbage. I, I'll be back at you and say, if you're a if you're, you're not a Christian if you don't follow the Sermon on the Mount. Take that, Jack, right? And it's Jesus first. It's his gospel first. It's his kingdom. There was a pastor I know. He's, a, he's very into health and everything and careful about what he eats. And he saw in the story, it was like, he said, there's this blueberry pomegranate ju juice. And it says, all natural, 100%. And he said, they had these beautiful pictures. So I said, I was going to get take it, but I do what I always do. I flipped down and looked at the ingredients. And they're in descending order. And it wasn't until you got six and seven that there was any blueberry or pomegranate. The f in fact, by the time you got there, it was like 1%. 99% of it was filtered water and preservatives and, and you know, uh, um, what's that other word that when it's not really juice? I'll, it'll come to me. Um, you know, fructose and all this stuff. And, and he said, as I was looking at that, I said to myself, where does Jesus rank in my life? Am I just Jesus flavored? Or am I Jesus filled? See, when we're, you can't do everything I'm about to show you that Paul prescribes for us to mend the fence and fix the divide. You can't do it if you're Jesus flavored. Jesus flavored people say, I love God. But boy, I don't like my neighbors over there. Jesus filled people say, I love God and I love my neighbors all my neighbors, and I'm willing to give my life for them if necessary, right? So Jesus first, that's his decision. When we get to chapter 14, and when we're filled with, with God, we cannot be overcome by evil. We can actually overcome evil with good. That's Paul. When we get to uh, chapter 14, you heard what Dave read. This is Eugene Peterson. It's a message. It's his interpretation. He's a great um, preacher and scholar. He said, in his own words, here's what he thought Jesus, what Paul was saying when he began to give his prescription. He says, welcome with open arms, fellow believers who don't see things the way you do and don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with, even when it seems that they are strong on opinions but weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. Now, this isn't about, you know, overtly, hurting people. You heard the series we said, do good, do no harm. If people are doing harm, you need to speak up. But if we're talking about whether to eat meat or to eat vegetables and the stupid to wear a mask or not, or, you know, these silly things, then be gentle. Be gentle, right? And here's, his, here's Paul's practitions. I'll give them to you pretty rapidly as I can. First, he says, do not judge, right? Three times in 14, those who eat, you must not look down upon them. You must not judge them because God has accepted them. So in verse 13, stop judging each other. In verse 10, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you look down on your brother and sister? We all, somebody say all, we, not some, we all will stand in the front of the judgment seat of God. There is a judge in the world and his name is not freed. Thanks be to God, somebody say. I know myself. <laughs> I know how conflicted I can be, right? It says, you know, don't, don't let that overtake you. The word in the Greek for judge is the word krino, which literally means to evaluate, to scrutinize, to prefer one thing over another. 
And, and, and that's, you know, all of us have our preferences, right? You know, you're a little bit country, I'm a little bit rock and roll, you know. Um, we, we, do, we have these things, and we evaluate things, and we scrutinize them, and we evaluate decisions. There's nothing wrong with that. What Paul says, just don't do it to each other. Do it over vegetables. Do it over, you know, trick or treat. Just don't do it to each other, right? Don't, don't fall in to that way. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, don't judge lest you be judged. And then he even said, now don't you, you better first get the log out of your own eye before you grab a magnifying glass and a pair of tweezers to get the splinter out of your neighbor's eye, right? This is first principle, don't judge. And don't become a stumbling block. Stop judging each other and never put a stumbling block or obstacle in the way of your brothers and sisters. If you do, you're no longer walking in love. Don't let your food or whatever your issue is, we all have issues. I got into an argument when my daughter was 13 years old and she said, Dad, you got issues. I said, I do not have issues. She said, that's your issue, right? So don't let your issue destroy someone else for whom Christ also gave his life and died, right? My wife's prayer since we went into ministry has been regular. She'll say to God, God, do not let Chip and I in our, in our desire to serve you stumble anyone else who wants to get to you, right? He, Paul said, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. He didn't say work out your neighbor's salvation <laughs> in fear and trembling, right? My, my, my spiritual mentor when I was ready to get into ministry and I was so eager and I was breathing fire and, and I was ready to go, you know, um, 34 years ago and, and 34 years later, you look like me, right? But, you know, back in the day, I'm ready to leap tall buildings and, and do all these things. And, and my spiritual mentor said to me, Chip, ministry's like shoveling snow. You got to give me more. What are you talking about? He said, you know, it's like shoveling snow. He said, you go out there, you're eager, you want to get the drow, you want to plow it. And, but he said, if you're doing it with blinders on, if you're doing it looking down the way, you know what you're going to do? You're going to shovel your driveway and you're going to throw all your snow on your neighbor's driveway. And then he said this to me. I wrote my journal so I'd never forget it. He said, you're going to find out you can be so focused on clearing your own path that you make it impossible for your neighbors to walk down theirs. So don't be a stumbling block through these things, right? And finally, not finally, one more after this, don't convict yourself, right? Strive for the things that bring peace. Build each other up, right? Don't, uh, people who are, ble are blessed who don't convict themselves by the things they approve. See, Paul's saying when you do these things, you think you're convicting others and the person you're convicting is yourself, you are convicted by your opinions, not because you have that opinion, but because the way you have that opinion, right? Jesus didn't say to us, go and be right all the time, but he did say, go and love all the time, right? Don't hold an opinion in such a way that you push people away from God, away from one another, even away from you, right? So don't judge, uh, don't stumble, don't convict, convict yourself by being a divider. And thirdly, anybody know the most interesting man? He sells a Mexican beer out there. Dos Equis. See, you guys get so quiet. I, I, said, this at, I said this at 9 a.m. I said, what is the most interesting man always said? All of them like, I ain't gonna say. I have no idea. He says what? Stay. Thank you. There's one sinner like me in the house. <laughs> Stay thirsty, my friends, right? Here's what Paul says. He says, stay humble, my friends. This is, a, this is when he's grounding himself in the gospel. Look what he says in Romans at the beginning. So you all get it right. There is no one who is righteous, not even one, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I will tell you this, it's 100% biblically accurate. Every Republican has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every Democrat has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every independent and libertarian and green tea and look at me um, has fought, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone in this room and online has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So stay humble. Don't be the judge. Let Jesus be the judge. Don't put snow on your neighbor's driveway so they can't even get out and grow in their own way. Don't uh, convict yourself by being this kind of person and stay humble, right? 
And when we do that, we can strive for the things that bring peace and the things that build each other up. What was very interesting about Robert Putman is on his curve of when we got so close together, you know who he said the greatest catalyst was for the building of community in America? It was the church. That's not Desmond Tutu saying that. This is a Harvard research professor. This is our job. Paul says at the end of 13, before he prescribes it, he says, now is the time for you to wake from sleep, for your salvation is nearer now than it was when you first believed. This is the time, folks. It's always the time, but especially the time when people are divided, for us to not hide behind our little political identity or opinions and not get out there and do the hard work that this church does every day to lay aside our differences and to work and walk and worship together as one. And as God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, Paul said he has given all of us this ministry of reconciliation. I love that he said strive. The word strive in the Greek is agonizami. Don't try to say that at home. It's a verb that means what? To contend with adversaries, to enter a contest, to struggle with dangers and difficulties. We need to strive for this. And we need to confront anything that seeks to prevent it from happening. Let me, let me close with this. When I moved here 30 years ago to be the pastor of this church, um, I was leaving being a superintendent, and uh, I wasn't to start here until September 26th. But we were moving my kids out of school, and Perry was going into seventh grade. Matthew was going into fourth grade. And school started like a month and a half earlier. And I said, look, I don't want to move my kids. I mean, they're going to have a tough time leaving their friends and moving and move them in after school starts. So the denomination paid to bring Terry up here and put her in corporate housing so the boys could start school. And to make new friends, they started to try to do activities. Ma Matthew ran for student government, and Perry being the proverbial jock, you know, he ran out and said, I want to play football. He'd never played football. He played golf, and he played basketball, and he excelled at both. But I said, sure, go play football, you know, seventh grade football. So I always try to be there for my kids, even though I was a couple hours away. And um, so what happened was Perry had his first game. Matthew had a, a d debate. Terry says, well, I'll go to Matthew's thing. Can you drive up and go to Perry's first game? I said, sure, I'll do that. I left work early. His first game, he went to Orange, down the street, Orange High School. Their first game was against Perry High School. I didn't, all I knew about Perry was he had a power plant. I didn't know anything else. So I go up there, and you're in the stands, you know, and there's these low seventh graders laying, and, and all of a sudden the game starts, and all the parents are shouting out, go, Richard, you know, go, George, go, Jake. And I said, go, Perry. <laughs> all of a sudden the people are kind of looking at me, and, and then Perry said, go, go, Timmy, go, Tom, go, Perry. And they looked at me and said, are you on the wrong side? <laughs> I said, no, my son, the new kid, his name is Perry. And Perry was really, really fast. He didn't know a thing about football, but the coach was smart because he was so fast. Perry, Perry would say, he would say, Perry, just make a fake and get right behind the, the def defensive back, and Richard's going to throw, throw the short pass, and he just run. And so right away they did that, and they threw it to Perry, and he ran 80 yards for a touchdown. Now all of our stands were like, go, Perry, go, Perry. Now across the way, because the field wasn't that big in middle school, the other fans are going, they're taunting us. So as Perry then moved down the field and they, they ran in for a touchdown, they started yelling, go Perry, go Perry. And, 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 and then they ran the same play and Perry ran 70 yards again for a touchdown. We all went, go Perry, go Perry. And now they heard, oh, the kid's name is Perry. So it became this mutual cheer and they would go do something good and they, they weren't taunting us anymore. They're smiling going, go Perry. And then Perry went and did something again and guess what? Both sides went, go Perry, go Perry. And I thought, man, is this a mark of the kind of ministry that I always want to do? And folks, if that can happen at a seventh grade football team, how much more ought to happen in the church? How much more ought that be part of our mission? To go out into the world and say, go Jesus, go God. And God loves you and God loves me and I'm broken and you are too, but we're better together than we are apart. And there's more that unites us 
than that which divides us. And we rebuke any force of wickedness. You know, when we take a vow to join this church, we say, I, I commit to confront evil, injustice, or oppression in whatever forms it presents itself because I want to unite. I want to get those impediments out of the way so we don't descend into division and argue over the stuff they argue about. And like I said, I think years from now, people are going to look back at us and say, they argued over that. They got violent over that. They separated with each other over that. But I pray for our church to just, we're not, we're not a better church, it's a different church. And that we model for the world. You know, you really can do this thing when you keep Jesus first and you don't sit on the judgment seat of the world, you let him do that. And you know that if I descend into division, I, am, I think I'm convicting others, I'm only convicting myself. And I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God and Jesus Christ has rescued me. And I'm not going back to the place of division. The cross was Jesus' vessel, God's vessel, to deal with the division we had for God, from God. And Jesus called his church to be the vessel to deal with the division people have one from another. Let's be that church. Let's be that voice in the midst of our concerns and our anxieties, and I have them too. Let us go out and proclaim the power of faith and hope and love. Amen? Go out. You know what breaks my heart is too many times there are preachers and churches that are sources of division and stoke it. And it breaks my heart. Don't do that. Go out and be instruments of healing. Fight injustice from the depths of your heart and be an ambassador of reconciliation. Can we do that? Go. We'll see you next week. The world will still be here. I'm going to still be here. Jesus is going to still be here. Go in peace. One, two, one.